this video we'll be looking at section 4 of particles booklet, focusing on particles and antiparticles. Now, antimatter is a peculiar idea. It's the idea that for every single particle that exists, there is another version, an alternate version. Now, this antimatter version of the particle will have the same mass, which is the same as saying its rest energy will be the same, but its quantum values will be opposite. Now, the only quantum value you're aware of at this stage is charge. So that means any positively charged particle would have a negative antiparticle, and vice versa. Now, it took a few years, but the first one discovered was an anti-electron, which was called a positron, because of the positive charge. Now, a cloud chamber was used to see this, where you have an alcohol vapour continuously being cooled by dry ice at the bottom of the chamber, and this allows interactions to be observed. Now, through use of a magnetic field, it's possible then to separate positive and negatively charged particles. So, you would have an invisible photon appear, causing this first line, which is a nucleus that's interacted with, gaining momentum, flying away. Then you get these two curling effects. Now they're what matters. They represent the positive and negative particles. So in this case, an electron and a positron here. And they will circle based on magnetic field effects. And they will go in opposite directions. So it makes them very easy to identify in a quick observation the short period they're observable. Now, looking at the antiparticles and particles as data is quite simple. Our symbols are just E and N for proton and neutron, E minus for electron, and then the neutrino symbol itself. Now, notice the electron is the only symbol with a charge shown. Now, we know a proton is positive, which makes this a bit of a peculiarity but just keep in mind. Now we know the proton has a charge of 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs, and that the electron has a minus equivalent of that, whilst the other two particles are neutral, as their name suggests, with NEU at the start. Now for the antiparticles, almost all of these have a logical, simple name. So an antiproton is particle of proton. An antineutron is the equivalent to a neutron. And an antineutrino, as we've encountered previously, is the neutrino equivalent. As anti-electrons were the first to be discovered, they still retain their peculiar, unique name, positron. Now, as far as symbols go, if the symbol does not have a charge shown, you simply draw a line above the symbol. So protons, neutrons, and neutrinos all have this effect. Whereas the electron, having a minus symbol, has that become a plus. So this is a universal rule. Just look at what you've got in the normal particle symbol on the data booklet and change the symbol, otherwise a line above. And the charge is, as we've said, simply invert. So where it was a positive charge for the proton, it's now a negative equivalent for the antiproton. Whereas the neutral particles remain neutral, making them particularly hard to distinguish. Now this is where these two processes come into play. Annihilation is an effect that allows us to tell that we have antimatter present, even without charges to separate them. Because if a particle meets its own corresponding antiparticle, they will annihilate. So that is to say, if a proton and an antiproton 
were to come into contact, they would completely erase their mass and convert it directly into energy. Now this energy can't just be stored somewhere, it has to be released. And it will be released as two equal energy photons. Now the easiest way to think through this is as though these two particle-antiparticles are going to meet each other without any kinetic energy involved. So in that case, all you have to consider is the rest energies. So we know that an electron's rest energy is 0.51 mega electron volts, and its antiparticles is the same. Now, if there was kinetic energy for either of these, we would add that in along with these two individual rest energies. Because at the end of the day, we're just combining all the rest energy and kinetic energy that we start with into a total, which in this case would be 1.02 mega electron volts. Now that has to then split. So whatever amount of energy you have at this point will be halved and split equally across two photons, making this a particularly easy example to work from. Just remember that if there was any kinetic energy to begin with, it would have been added to this total in the center and then split equally into these photons. Now, pair production is almost an inverse of this. In this case, we have a photon traveling along and it interacts with a nucleus. When it does so, nucleus takes away some of the momentum and allows the photon to slow down and become a particle-antiparticle pair. So this is the effect that we witnessed with the cloud chamber. And in this case, the only real requirement is that the photon has at least enough energy to cover the rest energies of that pair. So again, kinetic energy is just shared equally. So where previously it was added at the start, now we have kinetic energy at the end. If the photon has more energy than is needed, the excess shared kinetic energy to each particle and antiparticle. Now, it's worth remembering the fact that you have to interact with a nucleus for this to occur. It is often asked for in the exam. And it's part of the conservation rules that we follow in the universe where momentum is always conserved. So if we consider this example for an electron and positron to be produced, we know that they each have a rest energy of 0.51 mega electron volts. So yet again, the minimum value that the photon must have for energy is the combination, 1.02 mega electron volts. Now, if that's all that was used, unsurprisingly, neither of these, the particle or the antiparticle, will have kinetic energy, and they will very likely just annihilate immediately after this separation. But each of these instances are just snapshots of time. So don't worry about what happens afterwards. Now this image here shows us what we illustrated earlier. This is a photo from a cloud chamber where you can see that the photon is invisible and it will have entered from the top of this image just before the spiraling effects. So under a magnetic field, we will be able to manipulate charged particles, causing the photon to split into positive on one side, negative on the other, regardless of which particles they are. And the central line represents the nucleus has been kicked out of the way with the gained momentum. Thank you.
PSI.